Welcome to Inside the Industry, presented by the NAACP Hollywood Bureau and our program partner, Color Farm. We are really excited you could join us for this inaugural episode. We look forward to taking you behind the scenes and sharing the perspectives of some of the most prominent people working in media and entertainment. Today, we feature two very talented filmmakers, Erica Alexander and Dawn Porter, have dedicated their careers to moving the needle by making a social impact. They both entertain and inform. They've made a film, John Lewis, Good Trouble, which is a befitting tribute to the congressman and the lessons he's taught us. Most importantly, we all belong in the spaces that we occupy. And if you're ever told otherwise, then it's your responsibility to make good trouble. Let's listen in. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Dawn. Okay. Hi, Erica. <laughs> now, is this your worst nightmare for me to talk to you like this? <laughs> I'm like, is this what I agreed to? <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. We flipped surprise. <laughs> well, this is a really great honor to me. I'm, I'm really a very uh, proud of this film and very, very inspired and uh, certainly love you, love your talent, love everything about you. Um, uh, so we're gonna have a conversation, Dawn. We're gonna talk about things in the industry. We're gonna talk about the film, of course, talk about your life. I hope to you know, ask you some questions um, that uh, may be helpful for other people on their journey and um, get a little through your background a bit, which um, I don't think is spoken enough, especially for women of color in this industry to find out how, not only how you made it, but what you find important going forward. So uh, yeah, we'll do that. Um, you know, first of all, I wanna say, um, I'm just so proud to be here and of this uh, show and what an honor to be uh, part of the inaugural guest team. So thank you, NAACP. All my life, all I've wanted is an NAACP <laughs> Image Award <laughs> nomination. Okay, I'm lying, I want the award. But all my life, that's all I wanted. So um, hopefully now you all can see and at least consider consider this movie. Um, but all kidding aside, um, John Lewis is, uh, He's the person that I think we know, but I think that there's much more to his story. And that's why it was such a, a wonderful opportunity to uh, work on his story with you uh, and your partner, Ben Arnon, uh, and our producer, Laura Michael Chisholm and CNN Films. Um, sure. But also to uh, explore, you know, there's a lot of conversation these days about uh, does the race or gender, does the background of the creator matter in telling stories? And and I, I think it does. I think it does because I know what I was looking for and what you were looking for in the John Lewis story was to go beyond that which we already know, to not just point to the congressman's bravery and how he put his body on the line for us, mm -hmm. but how he's used his mind. Um, because that is something we all have the opportunity to do. So, um, so John Lewis's legacy is a, a story of resilience. Mm. It is a story of imagination. He had to imagine a world that he was not seeing and believe that it was possible. And I think that that's very, very powerful. It's very powerful for me. Um, if we are limited by the visions that other people have for us, we will not do great things. And so creating your own vision is something that he did so well. And, and I think as much as anything, that is a part of his legacy um, that, that I was interested in exploring and celebrating. Wonderful. And you, of course, did it very well. And thank God you did, because this is a very interesting year to release all of this. So um, the objectives of the civil rights movement and the Black Lives Matter movement. Well, how do you think they coexist? How, what were what, they? You know, I think, um, first of all, I do not want to take any power or agency from the movement for Black Lives because it is its own movement. They've created their own space. 
and uh, I'm just so proud of them. Um, but uh, I do think that there are um, lessons, and I, I think that what Mr. Lewis and the other civil rights activists did was kind of pry the door open and set a model to inspire further movements. And you know, one of the things that he is uh, very strong about is do things your way. But here's an example of how we did things. Take from it what works for, for your movement and then grow it, you mm -hmm. know? He, I think, has planted some seeds for all of us but um, you know, I know how thrilled he is to see all the people taking to the streets. That's what he's been saying his whole life. If you see something that's not right, not fair, not just, yes. do something. Get in, <laughs> Get in trouble. Get into good trouble. Good trouble. Necessary trouble. <laughs> <laughs> that's in my head. You know, it's ringing in my head. Dawn, we're going to watch a little bit of the trailer right now. Let's show them what we're talking about a bit. My philosophy is very simple. When you see something that is not right, not fair, yeah. not just, yeah. say something, yeah. do something, get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. He was always different than every member of Congress. Everybody knew what he had done. He was John Lewis. We're marching today to dramatize to the world that hundreds and thousands of Negro citizens denied the right to vote. Congressman Lewis gave us the blueprint to organize and to legislate. The reason why he's effective as a leader is because he's lived it. We made a decision to march in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion from Selma to Montgomery. You are ordered to disperse. That march will not continue. I was hit in the head. My knees went from under me. I thought I was going to down the bridge. If John Lewis, as a 19, 20 year old, wasn't doing what he did, I would not be here. We used to march with the spirit of love and with the spirit of dignity that we have shown here today. The whole time he was in the movement, it was frightening, knowing the danger, knowing what could happen. You cannot replace a John Lewis. He's the most courageous person I ever met. Too many people struggled and died to make it possible for every American to exercise their right to vote. He challenges the conscience of the Congress. Bring common sense gun control legislation to the House floor. Forty years later, John Lewis continues to inspire us. Are you with me? Let me hear you. Three civil rights workers that were murdered for trying to help people get registered to vote are looking down on us. This is a time for action. That's what I learned from John Lewis. Their forces in America today want to take us back, but we're not going back. We're going forward. That's a powerful thing. I love it. Each time. You know what? I rock out to. I do too. Do you? I went to Tamar Callie's score. It's fantastic. I sometimes wake up humming that music. It just like lifts me up. I just love that music. So it, it's fantastic. And we'll talk about her a little bit too. So are we still crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge? Are we still there? We are crossing it. You know, we are, we, we have it in our sights. We intentionally step forward. And, you know, what I love is, as you know, we were down there and we filmed with him, with the congressman, mm -hmm. as he leads, every year he leads uh, what he calls a pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. And a pilgrimage has religious connotations, right? But it has intentional moral connotations. Mm -hmm. A pilgrimage is a path, is a journey that you take um, to be reflective and to honor the sacred space. And so by doing that each year, he has, he and everybody who joins him has made it sacred space. So um, that was, you know, you could feel the energy in that moment. And, and I, I loved being there with him where, you know, we have a tradition and as we all know in the black community, our oral tradition, we mm. tell our stories to keep them alive, to keep them present. And John Lewis is very much of that oral tradition where we go back to that bridge, we remember what happened, but we go across. 
mm. walk across, which is a triumphant walk because he wasn't, he was turned away, but we walk across. Yeah. It's funny. He, we walk across no matter his, I guess his ultimate thing is no matter what's facing you, you have to get over that bridge. That's right. And that's why he keeps going back and reminding us that we continue to need to march across. We have to keep moving forward. We cannot assume that we have reached the promised land because clearly we have not. So tell me, define for us, what is good trouble? Good trouble is, uh, as the congressman said, it's good trouble, necessary trouble. So, you know, it's really important to remember when John Lewis was a teenager, he lived in the time of Emmett Till, where if you looked at a white woman or you were alleged to have looked at a white woman in a sexual way or in any way, you could be killed. Mm. And so his mother, when he would challenge, just as teenagers do, they challenge segregation, they challenge discrimination. He couldn't get a library card as a young man. Can you imagine turning, the library is segregated? You can't read next to somebody. It's all a function of trying to humiliate and denigrate people who are have black and brown skin. So when he would challenge those practices, his mother would say, you know, as mothers do, I am a mother. I am constantly telling my children not to get in trouble. Mm. Um, and she would say, boy, that's the way it is. And I think that's the, the, the thing that really stuck in his craw, that there was, she was suggesting there wasn't anything that they could do, that they just that's had to remedy it. it. That's just right. Accept it. And so she would say, don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. And her, that was born of fear for her child. And he turned that on his head and said, it's my life and I'm gonna get into some things that are trouble, but it's good trouble, it's necessary trouble. And how right he was, you know, mm -hmm. segregation was the law at the time. So you can't always look and assume that the laws are just. And he had to look in his own heart and decided to, sac to, to be ready to make the ultimate sacrifice of even his life because he did not want to live in a world if the, of that's the way it is. Mm. You know, I love that. That's wonderful. You know what I love about black people that we're futurists because we see a world that isn't there and we try to bring it forward. And that, and, and you always speak to the great strategists and intellectuals that came to create this movement. Can you speak a little bit to that? And then we'll also talk about the parallels between us if we have any you, that are discernible. And so we are futurists, which is why you have that very sparkly, beautiful outfit looking <laughs> to the stars. <laughs> <laughs> that baby, I, I rolled in from the planet Krypton. You know, it is because I am so envious. Every time you wear that shirt, I I, I feel like the little teeny tiny you know, mole <laughs> under your shining, beautiful light. You're so gorgeous. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just trying to hang with you. You know, I got to show off a shirt. See, you, 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 you know, I cannot let the wearing of my favorite outfit go unremarked upon. Thank um, you. So I've forgotten the question. I wish, well, I was saying that, you know, that we're futurists. So, you know, talk about the intellectual strategy. Yeah. Yes. You know, and, and this also, I think, goes to um, who tells our stories. Yeah. You know, uh, so as a, as a black person, what I see in John Lewis is a political genius. Mm. It is him and the other civil rights activists. We celebrate um, rightfully so his bravery and all of, all of them, their bravery and how they put their bodies in the way of injustice. Mm. But we also need to celebrate their minds. And until we are celebrated for our intelligence, and that is the assumption, that is what springs to mind when we see a John Lewis, like that is when I will think that we are really making some progress and we are becoming free. But those young people, so they built, the Nashville community was very progressive, had a very strong African-American, um, you know, organizing committee of adults. And I'll say adults like, 35, you know, 40 years old. Yeah. And they had been organizing to desegregate downtown Nashville, but it really was the students who took that movement from, uh, you know, the tests that the, the older folks were doing and they crossed that bridge. Mm. They, they crossed the line. They strategized, they trained with Reverend Lawson, they trained in the methods of nonviolence, they prepared themselves. But then the, the big thing is they kept going back. 
They didn't go home when it got tough. And that is why we celebrate them because that is not a choice that each of us is in the position to make. I am not as brave as John Lewis. I, I admit that. I have to find other ways to contribute mm -hmm. um, because I'm a chicken. <laughs> Well, I would I would actually defend you any day. The bravery that you have, the things that you've chosen to put your light on in terms of your filmmaking, and it takes years to make these things. You're giving your years to these subjects, not only to John Lewis, but to Gideon's Army, to uh, the John F. Kennedy thing. That's a brave thing. And I think that as creatives, we don't often see ourselves as having that sort of thing, putting our selves on the line, but you most certainly did. It makes you a target. People know what you're about. You can never live that down. It's inside of your, you know, your ethos and what you push forward. And so I salute you, sister. I say you a street soldier as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, my darling. Thank you. You're very welcome. And we're and thank thank God for us because if you had not started that uh, this year, um, the truth is we might have missed an opportunity for several reasons, and we'll get into that too. I wanted to ask you, you know, are there any parallels between us, you and me, that you see? Um, I do. You know, I think um, one of the many things that I admire. I'm gonna get emotional. <laughs> about you is, um, well, I think you don't let anyone box you in. And I think when you're a creator of color, it is so easy to take the roles that are offered. Sure. And I have seen you refuse to be pigeonholed. Um, and, you know, I'm trying hard to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to have the voice that I want to have, not only the opportunities that are offered, but the ones mm -hmm. that I want to take. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I see you doing that. Um, so okay. I don't know if there are parallels, but there are things that I, I you know, I, I, that I look up to you and, and that I try and take into, into my lane, you know, as an actor, um, I know that this industry is not, easy to navigate for anyone. Sure. And so for those of us who have broken through, um, we carry a special responsibility and that's not always an easy thing, you know? When, uh, so I see you reaching back and reaching forward and reaching every which way. <laughs> grabbing. And grabbing people. So that is something I try and do as well. Um, but I, I think the um, something we don't share, but I'm trying is I, I think that you are very bold creatively. And um, so I, I think uh, more of us in all of our disciplines could, could use that as a guiding light, like be bold. You know, John Lewis says, you only, you only pass this way once. Ooh. There, there's no second, you know, second chance for your life. Yeah. So, what are you waiting for, everybody? What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? What are you? Wow. Um, thank you. That's a beautiful thing. And if I start talking, I will get emotional. Like um, I get very emotional. Everyone wants to know about Dawn. I think she is phenomenal. I really love the fact um, of how you just um, take your presence in the set. Um, I didn't know it was a thing or something that I could learn from until I watched you. But you have an innate sort of sense of your um, right to be there. And, um, and I watch you. And this is a person I've been around for 37 years on sets watching, but I don't think I've gotten a chance to really watch uh, um, up close a black woman who was in real time over this long length of time. I come in, I play a role for a very short length of time and I keep moving. There's other things that have to be done. I'm not you know, able to just sit there and not do anything on that set except for just watch the, the mechanism work. And so mm -hmm. I appreciate that that was something that I realized um, that probably more people need to see. It's like when some people go back to Africa and they realize that they matter. Mm -hmm. It was one of those aha moments for me was like, Look at how she's doing this, Erica. And then we had a discussion, you and I, at dinner, where you said, you know, uh, and you and you gave me some some real insight uh, into that. I think it's part of your DNA, frankly. 
people should know. Can you tell a little bit? I'm gonna say that you are related to Paul Robeson. Can you say that? Because I feel like I feel this. When you said that, I said, of course she is. I knew you were related to somebody amazing. And when you said that, I was jealous, but I was jealous in a good way because I was like, she knows a little bit, like you say, John Lewis has the land of where you come from. Could you talk about that? You know, that that is important. So my grandmother's uh, maiden name was Marion Robeson. And her father is Ben Robeson, was Ben Robeson. And uh, uh, Ben Robeson was a pastor at Mother Zion AME Church in New York City in Harlem. Um, his brother was Paul. And so I, you know, as I, I always knew, um, AME ministers are known for, you know, being Northern counterparts for civil rights. So my great grandfather would host, you know, his brother Paul when he was being uh, targeted uh, unfairly when he, he was, you know, he was a trailblazer. He not only graduated from law school, he also was a Broadway actor. He yes. spoke seven languages. He traveled abroad. And so as a result, he became a target and his passport was revoked because that was the thing that made him free. You know, he spoke, he was a big union person. He spoke, um, he basically integrated, um, He, you know, he was an actor in the 40s on Broadway when black people couldn't yes. go to the shows. Oh. So he's known for speaking at peak skills. So there was this here presence of, you know, this patina of activism that I didn't know I come from. But the real thing that, that got me was um, I read my great grandfather's sermons and he, my grandmother used to type them. So, so I have the uh, these original sermons and he was a beautiful writer, beautiful, beautiful writer. So that was instructive to me, how educated this man was, you know, his father had escaped slavery. So mm. in just one generation, you know, he managed to, um, you know, become part of this activist generation. The AME church's background is they split from the Methodist church uh, because of segregated worshiping. Mm -hmm. So my relatives are lived in uh, New Jersey, near Princeton, there was a cemetery, um, but that that church was, uh, you know, was founded by my, my, my relatives, yeah. Amazing. Um, we're gonna run a couple of John Lewis's photos and, um, you know, um, and show the type of people you're uh, you're from. I mean, look at that. Yeah. Thing. So these are we're seeing photos uh, from our our filming. So we followed. This is in a church. Uh, this is that time on the Selma Bridge where this is Keith Walker in the front there filming. Um, and then you take a look back at the significance of that day. You can see that. Um, the original photos were from uh, from some of our, our filming. So we spent a year filming with the congressman and uh, he was up for everything. You know, it's like, Mr. Lewis, can we go to Troy? And he said, yes, we can. And, you know, Mr. Lewis, can we come to your house at eight o'clock? Yes, we can. Um, so we really, you know, it was such a shock uh, to hear about his health condition because we literally could not keep up with him when we were, his schedule was so intense that, you know, my, my cameraman was like, is he going to take a break? You know, my we, back hurts. Can I put this my back hurts. I got to put this camera down. Um, so, uh, so it, it was, uh, you know, looking back, you never know what time you're going to have. And so, um, you know, it's another reminder to enjoy the moments that you are in because uh, you know you may not have the opportunity to have them again. So that's true. You were on that Edmund Pettus Bridge with him. What's the significance yeah. of the movement to dismantle monuments that glorify Confederate figures? And do you think it should be renamed? I absolutely think it should be renamed. It is named currently for a Klan member. We mm. do not need to celebrate members who brutalize, beat. African Americans, Jews, anybody who is not their version of white enough. Um, that is a terrible legacy and statues and symbols matter, you know? Um, so so what do we want our, our children to honor? Um, that is not what we want our children to honor. So it, there's been proposals to rename it Freedom Bridge or, 
you know, uh, the Lewis Bridge, whatever, it should be renamed. What it should not, I, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I feel like very strongly that the local people of Selma and, and all of those folks should decide yeah. what they would like in their community, they live there. Yeah. Um, but I'll tell you what it should not be named is Edmund Pettus. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever you all are gonna name it, it you, could, you know, it should not be that. So. Absolutely, I agree, I agree. Um, you, um, we have, I should say, we have this uh, NAACP virtual cinema program I think we should talk about and tell people what it's about. Look at that. I know. <laughs> so what it is, is, you know, the, the NAACP is actually offering to their members a way to not only watch the film, but it's a, it's also a simultaneously a fundraiser because some uh, half of the net profit, profits of that ticket goes to the NAACP. And so uh, you probably received an email or something like it or should, or in, in and it's offering an invitation to uh, participate in that. Um, you know, this is something that uh, there have been so many tragedies um, because of the pandemic, but this is, uh, is the smallest of silver linings is that we are able to offer this opportunity is not only a way to celebrate Mr. Lewis and learn more about his life, but to support the NAACP and their work. Yeah. Um, the NAACP has been a stalwart, has been the repository for so much of our history. And so to be able to uh, contribute to this organization that has given so much um, is, is really very exciting and completely in keeping with, you know, people say, what can I do? You can support people doing the work, you know, do your own work and then support our organizations because, you know, we need you. Yeah. So, um, and in fact, you can watch a movie and support the organization. And all of them, in this virtual cinema uh, presentation, they're going to see an interview with Oprah that they can't see anywhere else. That's right, um, Oprah. I am doing a project with Oprah right now, but uh, uh, about mental health, um, which uh, is 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 very exciting. But uh, she loves Mr. Lewis, <laughs> and so they had. She, it was supposed to be 15 minutes. They spoke for 45 minutes. Wow. We produced uh, an interview that gives you even more insight. Um, they have a very special relationship. You know, when she was the executive producer of Selma, she marched across that bridge with him. Um, she is constantly shining a light onto people who are part of our history and our collective, you know, forefathers and foremothers. So this is a unique only for this uh, theatrical period. That is the only place that you can see their personal converse conversation. It was just Oprah and Mr. Lewis, and she asked him all the questions that uh, she wanted to know about. And uh, I, he loved it, you know? Um, so it's really special. I'm honored and thrilled to offer it to, to all of you. And it's, it's six ninety nine to rent the movie. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, I, um, so, you know, um, Actually, I think it's a little different all through the virtual cinema thing, but then half that money is going to the um, to the organization. Um, how can media, the media, be utilized to make good trouble? Yeah, you know, um, images matter and stories matter. And now when um, we are at a reflective moment in our history, when we are thinking about, hopefully thinking about what we want to say and what we want to, who we want to be, um, for me, the images of Mr. Lewis and all of the other civil rights workers, they lift, they lift me up those yeah. images and those stories. Those, that, that, those are our people, right? That's where we come from. Mm -hmm. so, um, but you know, the media is, um, is, is, you know, a crucial part of our connection and our exchange of information. And so, critically evaluating media, evaluate your sources, ask questions of the gatekeepers. What are you seeing? What do you wanna see more of? Mm -hmm. uh, the reason that I started my career, I was very happily working at first, I worked for ABC News and then I worked for A&E Television. And as my husband says, I had a direct deposit job. Um, <laughs> but you know, what I wasn't seeing 
were stories about people who look like me. And I wasn't, and when I did see them, you know, it was stories like, it was shows like Cops. Yeah. Where we were face down and in a subservient, you know, position. I think that, that, you know, shows like that do so much harm because it, it allows you to disengage from your humanity and from the humanity of the person at the bottom of that knee. Ooh. So, you know, so that is why I have made my career in media, because, you know, if I have the power to focus the lens in a different place, focus the lens and the storytelling on the intelligence, creativity, mm -hmm. resilience of our people, then then that's important. That's right. I mean, we might not have had uh, well, we'll always have issues in life, but I really believe that if Ahmaud Aubrey had been seen as a person with potential uh, to, to contribute to society, he wouldn't have been hunted down like he was uh, disposable. And that's exactly what happened to George Floyd and all these people were seen as disposable in mass media. So therefore, when it's imprinted on people and continued throughout um, so sort of the white narrative, uh, that's what happens. And when you think about you know the civil rights movement, it really was those shocking images of these peaceful young people mm. to register to vote that shocked the country and shook it to its core, and you know influenced some very powerful people, including the Kennedys um, and Lyndon Johnson, and then you know down on down on the line. So, media matters. But who is speaking through the media also matters. And that is is what we need to support. We need to support people who are trying to tell full stories and inclusive stories and using inclusive, you know, means of identifying the storytellers. John Lewis carried that backpack and it was filled <laughs> with a Bible, the US Constitution, an apple. An a apple an apple, because he knew he wouldn't be coming back, as you know, so across that Edmund Pettus Bridge. And the NAACP is launching the Good Trouble Activist Campaign. And this is inspired by Congressman Lewis, and uh, they will be distributing backpacks filled with resources that will inform future leaders of tomorrow how to build social movements. What do you think, what kind of information do you think is necessary to prepare the next generation of social activists? Um, I think that uh, we need to understand how our government works. I mean, one of the things, you know, we're all very focused on our presidential election, but politics is really local. Yes. Your school board representatives determine what curriculum your teachers' children are being taught. They determine whether there are police in the schools that mm. to criminalize, you know, children of color. Um, your judges determine whether excessive bail is set. They mm most prosecutors are elected. If you elect a progressive prosecutor, like they did in Philadelphia, then you will have somebody who's trying to, and, or San Francisco, you have people who are actively trying to dismantle the system of uh, you know, punitive criminal justice. So paying attention as much as you can, I know a lot of ask, is asked of all of us, but for your particular backpack, I would encourage you to, to learn, try and learn a little bit about what's happening in your local elections. Because as we need to turn out in massive numbers, um, you know, then as you pull that lever for president, you also need to know who you're voting for, for your school board, for your congressperson, for your judges, for your prosecutors, all of the elected positions. Um, that's what really controls our lives. Absolutely. And for people who don't know, because by the way, I get confused. I live in California. There's a lot of initiatives and things that are on the ballot. And I don't know. I'm afraid that if I vote, I'll vote for the wrong yes or no. But there are people who do know organizations like the NAACP do know. You can ask them if you trust their um, opinion or you think they have your interest, best interest in mind. You can ask your friends and then take some time to get prepared to go into that booth do a little homework, it'll make it easier for you, less stressed out and you'll feel better when you step out that you really have participated in it, um, in things. Um, there's, you're like a bad mamma jamma. <laughs> you really are. People don't know you've been a professor. You have to say the second line. You have to say, just as fine as she can be. <laughs> yeah, they, want to, they, they don't want to see all this come out right now. 
you know, yeah. Well, I'd love to see you in a bikini. That's what I know. That's how bad of a jib jamba jamba you are. <laughs> but you know, you you um, how do you balance not only the imperative to entertain, but the need to address social inequities? You're also uh, there's new challenges as black female storytellers that we face in Hollywood, maybe to be the truth tellers and yeah. at the same time not have the the whole sort of you talk talk a lot about full um, agency. Yeah. How do you do that? Um, you know, uh, I first say I try to do it as much as anybody can be, you know, self-aware. We all have to be self-aware. Um, but I, I think um, there's no substitute for being well prepared. So if you are strong in your craft, that is where your power comes from. You know, if people want to work with you, um, then that's where you get the opportunity to push, you know, your own agenda. So, so um, as a result, <laughs> what I try and do is work with people who know what they're doing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and empower them. And, and so I have a lot of really great collaborators and I try and work with people over and over so that we learn each other's, you know, strengths and weaknesses. So for example, I work a lot with Tony Hardman and Keith Walker as cinematographers. Um, and we know, you know, two African-American men, we know each other's, you know, both of them are um, really brilliant uh, cinematographers. Um, but I know I can trust yeah, them. They're very yeah. good. Yes, I can trust them to, I trust their, their eyes. So I love letting, seeing what they see, you know, so I'll get what I need, but then empower them to go get what they see. Mm -hmm. um, same with editors. I've been working with Jessica Congdon in these last two films, John Lewis, Good Trouble, and then also uh, a film about President Obama's White House photographer and the, the two million photos that he took. When's that coming out? Uh, September. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you're busy. Okay, it's good for everybody to know that. Look at everybody. Okay. Yes. Um, but you know, understand like putting together a team. I'm very much like nobody makes a movie by themselves. Yeah. So like the 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 key for me is I want to create the environment I want to work in, which is where you you make space for people. Um, because you know, I think that the best work comes, you do have to have a vision, you do have to have something you wanna say. And, and I think also that's kind of like the heart of it is don't just, it's not just putting up an iPhone camera and shooting. Like mm -hmm. I have something I wanna say mm -hmm. and I'm always really thinking about, does this serve, does this storytelling, does this particular scene serve what I'm trying to say? And then mm -hmm. really put, put, putting myself in the spotlight, like what, what do you mean? What do you mean by this? What are you trying to point out here? Um, mm. So so being intentional, I think is very important. And you know, it was really wonderful. We had a lot of help from Rachelle O'Neill, who's in the constituent, um, his uh, representative there, and also Mike, Michael Collins, and we should call them out. And they were wonderful uh, as our conduits to the congressman. They do a, a job every day together to um, uh, manage an icon and, um, also, uh, I certainly would love to know when you say that you have um, sort of something you're trying to say, what is it you want for us? What do you intend for us as the viewers of John Lewis Good Trouble to take away from this piece? Um, I would like to emphasize um, how much possibility there is in the world. I think uh, right now things feel very dark and very, you know, constricted and closed. And uh, we do not live in a situation where there is segregation by law, where um, there, you know, it is complete, uh, completely inadequate schooling and no possibility of advancement for black people. We have farther to go, but we have made progress. We have record 55 members of the Black Caucus elected to Congress. One. Um, we have, you know, black and brown prosecutors, people in places of influence. So, but we just need to keep pushing those doors open. So, um, you know, care for yourselves, do what you can. The Congressman's lesson, I think, is one step at a time. He did not go out there looking to be 
you know, the leader of a movement, but he was good at what he did. And so he kept, you know, being given opportunities. So um, everyone has to decide for their lives. When you see an opportunity, do you want to leap at it or, you know, are you going to shy away? And I hope people will, if they're up for it, take that opportunity to, to leap into things. Not everything is, not every outcome is certain, but it, you will not know if you don't try. Well, we're going to be wrapping up here a little bit. I have another question for you and just want to thank everybody not only for coming to talk to us here, but also to watch the film and um, and to continue to have these kind of dialogue and discussions. And again, the NAACP is a wonderful place because <clears throat> it's taken on many of the cases that have advanced um, our journey here on earth as uh, people of color. And that means all people of color, people who don't understand that about the NAACP. But um, this is about Hollywood overall and sort of to tell us a little bit about how, do, how does Hollywood advance or stifle the call for greater diversity in storytelling? Um, Hollywood has, like so many other um, you know, organizations, has a lot of work to do. Too often uh, the, the gatekeepers are not willing to take a chance. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and the goalpost is always moved. Mm. Has this person directed a this or a that or the next thing? Um, so I think it's up to, uh, there are people with power in Hollywood who look like us. Yeah. And if, you know, I won't call out particular names, but if people who are the number one actors in the world insist on diverse crews, mm -hmm. insist on bringing writers, writers are so important, right? It's not just the director, it's the material that yeah. is being spoken from the actors. That's a lot of power. Um, but uh, you know what else? We just need to stop going if we don't have, I, I feel like we need a little check mark. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, this, like an NAACP approval. You know? Like yes. this, this production was made with an inclusive team. Absolutely because if we do not hold people accountable, um, there is no incentive for the person with the power to give it up. Yes. We need to demand it. Absolutely. And we have buying power, we have talent in sports, in music, in acting. Um, people of color are on top in all of those, in all of those oh, things. So- We could, we could shut down people, if we don't. They yeah. have, if yeah. that kind of person says, I want this person or show me what you have, um, people will listen. So we've been polite <laughs> and now we need to be perhaps a little bit more direct. And, and I also want to address, um, even as black people, we are all also influenced by the racism that says that black people are inferior. Mm. And so, People don't want to risk their careers by going with the untested person. And I think we all have to ask ourselves, get over that. And uh, ask yourself if you think so-and-so is not qualified to do your film or your movie or your legal deal or your house representation or whatever, why that is. We have to ask ourselves those questions as well. Because it's not, at this point, we have enough economic power and enough representation across the panoply of important things, particularly in sports, right? Particularly in entertainment. Right. The most influential entertainers, you know, are usually people of color right now. So, yeah. so uh, you know, we need help. And, and I, I turn that lens on myself as well, you know, hiring women hiring people of color, um, you know, making sure that are we crazy diverse. That are crazy diverse, that's right. In genders, gay, straight, black, white, female, it's just everything. So it's a, in fact, can we talk really quick? I said it was blast, but we have to mention Tamar, who's a killer. Let's talk about her. Killer Tamar. 
Yeah. Tamara Kali is the genius behind the music um, of this film. We didn't know if we could get her. She had just come from uh, doing D. Reese's Mudbound. Um, so I asked her to write a modern spiritual and she just slayed. Um, her roots are she's Gullah Geechee. She understands the connection to land um, and bringing her femaleness, her her diverse musical taste, yeah. um, just I will just forever be grateful to her. I do. I wake up humming her music. It just has such staying power and just lifts me up. So, um, but that's an example of looking to see who you know. She had not done documentary. She's new to doing scoring. Dee Rees has worked with her a few times and it was just my joy and honor to work with her. I probably can't afford her anymore, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> she deserves all of her roses. So, uh, you know, I hope to keep collaborating with her. Oh, me too. Well, thank you, Dawn. It's been one of the great pleasures and joys of my life to work and learn from you. Um, I have been directing. Uh, a doc myself, and I think about you all the time, especially when it comes to uh, my confidence. Uh, you say I'm bold uh, and here or there. I don't see myself that way. I see myself as always trying to push myself, as uh, to push forward and um, assert myself. As much as I talk and I'm a social butterfly, it's um, a constant sort of a thing for me. And um, I, I love you, girl. I really do. I hope you know that. Uh, thank you to Laura Michael Chisholm and you for allowing Color Farm to be on this journey with you. Um, ben Arnon would say the same thing. That's my co-founder for, for people who don't know. And also we need to um, invite everybody to go to the NAACP virtual cinema to watch Good Trouble. And please watch it through that portal because you'll also be contributing to the NAACP and John Lewis so wanted this social impact campaign to affect the organizations that had supported him his whole life. Also, um, for more information on the Hollywood Bureau, visit NAACP.org, that's .org, on social media. And also you can come to colorfarmmedia.com, colorfarm, F-A-R-M, media.com on social. Don Porter, Don Porter um, is at visittrilogyfilms.com on social media, like us, follow us. Uh, we appreciate your support and we need you as we go forward. In order for us to discuss things and talk with you or to tell you about her next film, uh, follow her so she knows you're there and you'll see um, her dialogue with you as she goes through life. This is one of the great talents of our um, generation and she's gonna continue doing great things and I'm gonna push her and she doesn't need to be pushed to do, you know, um, fiction and uh, see what she does. Huh? <laughs> the F word. Oh, the F word. It is the F word. It's a good F word. She, I said, if you make a good fiction film, you cry real nonfiction tears. So you know, it all works. It all works. Thank you, Dawn. I appreciate you, my love. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.